So I decided to hop down the Assassin's Creed rabbit hole and see how long ago they started this trend of releasing just terrible games that have no business being associated with the AC brand. And um, I didn't expect to find it quite this early. I had remembered not liking AC3 and hadn't played it since launch, so I was essentially going into this game fresh along with low expectations. It was the perfect recipe for it to surprise me with something good. But I didn't expect just how bad this game was going to be. There's definitely still the Assassin's Creed formula here, albeit a bit weak, but there's a battle between the Templar and Assassin ideology to some small degree, and it still feels Assassin's Creed-ish. This game hadn't gone quite off the deep end yet, I don't think at least, but it was certainly standing right on the edge. You can expect full spoilers going into this, and to be honest, you shouldn't worry about it, because whether you're a fan of the series or not, this game simply isn't worth your time. If everybody who wanted to hop off has, let's get into Assassin's Creed 3, unfortunately. Oh, holy shit, I don't even know where to start with just how much I hate this game. I really didn't want to, but it's just bad. It's not even like, oh, I'm just gonna put this down bad. It's bang my head against the desk kind of bad. The combat is a little harder than the last game, but it's not any more rewarding. The updates to the notoriety system make the getting around town part annoying and discourage you from doing any of the randomly generated side content they added just for this game. The parkour feels pretty good, but it's not any faster than just walking along the ground, so there's no reason to do it, meaning you probably won't. Playing through historic moments in US history should be really cool, but maybe it's because I'm American and know my history, or just the fact that the missions often fall flat that I find it kind of boring at the end. Connor is trained as an assassin, and your main antagonists are part of the Templar Order, but you don't have that as a personal reason to fight, as it's really just a revenge mission for Connor that, unlike Ezio, never evolves into anything more interesting. Connor himself is an incredibly irritating character who feels like someone very much wanted to write the good guy fighting an evil system, but didn't have any idea on how to do that. He rants and raves about how all people should be free, and I guess in a way acts on that, but for the most part he just bitches at people he's allied himself with before still helping them. He works alongside people who have proven to him that they don't have any notion of helping him or his people and he goes along with it just choosing the lesser of two evils, which I'm not cool with. There's a world where this outline of a native fighting to help his own people and being betrayed by both sides of the conflict he finds himself in is really interesting. It's just not this one. Connor never seems to learn or grow over the course of the game. Altair went from an arrogant short-sighted man to one who was patient, thoughtful, and led the assassins to new heights. Ezio was a child dragged into a war he fought tooth and nail to stay out of, wise beyond his years, but once he was in, he embraced the assassin's ideals and fought for them across his entire life, bettering the world around him. Connor was a boy who, filled with a thirst for revenge, sought his destiny only to spend his life trying to kill a man, not killing him several times for reasons I can't understand, we'll talk about it later, only to finally get to him, accomplish nothing, and resign himself to being bitter in defeat. Man, I'm just really fucking ranting right now, roll the gameplay intro. Alright, let's get to the gameplay so I can go on a very long, angry tirade against the story. When it comes to the combat, I'm a fan. Nice. I definitely don't enjoy it as much as Revelations, but I can admit that it's a more challenging system and in a good way. The combat feels pretty fluid, but much slower than previous games. Connor has a much more brutal combat style that is more realistic than before, and he has to do a lot more to secure a kill than Ezio did. There's no dancing your way through a troop of enemies here. Connor cuts like he's an evil hotel executive. I slice like a goddamn hammer. There's also several unique enemy types that will catch you lacking if you're not paying attention, forcing you to actually use guard breaks to take them down, and that's a good thing. Guns are obviously far more prevalent here, but it doesn't really make much of a difference to be honest. You'll be hitting that human shield button more often than before, but that's about it. The reality is that your single shot pistol you have no reason to upgrade at any point is more of a fuck off button than a weapon, and at most point, the troops you'll encounter will use their rifles as melee weapons far more often than they do as firearms. 
Speaking of gear, this is the first time in the series I've had the option to upgrade my equipment and never bothered to over the course of the game. The simple truth for me was that I didn't organically acquire money, and even when I had a little bit in my pocket, I couldn't find anything to spend it on other than consumables. The only weapon I bought was a cooler looking pistol that worked exactly the same as the one I was given for free, and I think the biggest problem this game has is that if you aren't really into the stuff in the store, there's nothing to work for. I'm willing to bet most people would rather have the cool ass assassin's tomahawk than the plain looking steel one that does more damage. It's the only truly iconic part of the game, and from a stats perspective, there's no reason to hold on to it. Thankfully, stats mean absolutely nothing here. There's also no armor to level up here, and again, no reason you'd need to, so bleh. Excited to get on my grind again in Black Flag next. Pistol swords, here I come. So that's combat, but what about movement? Well, that's a bit of a mixed bag. There's a ton of really well done animations here that you'll see moving through the trees or using the new chase breakers here that were found and lost in America. On the flip side, there's not a big chance you'll get to see a lot of this. In AC1, you moved across the rooftops because it was faster. In Ezio's games, you did it because it was cooler and more fun. Here, it's neither. I hope you like watching Connor run because frankly there's no faster way to get around town than just running through the streets. Whereas before you needed to climb viewpoints to find your way around, here the map will sort itself out as you move through the streets. A welcome change, but it means you'll likely not be climbing any viewpoints around town. Although the eagle does spread its wings on the minimap when you sync with a viewpoint, and I think that's a very nice touch. There's also a decent amount of the game spent out on the frontier, and as much as I like the tree climbing mechanics, yet again, it's just not an efficient way to get around unless there's snow on the ground holding you back. And running everywhere on flat surfaces does not make for an interesting Assassin's Creed. I swear, half the playtime in these games is dedicated to boring runs from objective to objective, which quickly drove me insane. I think I blame the setting more than anything else here, because a true-to-life 18th century USA just wasn't a setting that was going to play well to the series' strengths, but it doesn't mean the game was made poorly. Last thing I want to bring up is the notoriety system. To be blunt, it's annoying. Even at level 1 you'll have a hard time moving around town without starting a fight and that's just irritating. It also means that when you see these random missions on the street encouraging you to help out citizens you're likely to just ignore it because it's not worth the hassle of either fighting or fleeing from the guards and finding someone to bribe to lower your wanted level. I believe actions in games should have consequences but those consequences shouldn't be that you don't want to play the game or use its mechanics. Overall, I like the gameplay here, but I hate that it feels as though Ubisoft would really prefer if I didn't partake in it. Anyways, let's move along to my real gripes in the story. Roll the tape. America has no need for Send your them services, back to gentlemen. In a box. My name is Desmond Miles, and this is my story. When it comes to the story of Assassin's Creed 3, you need to know that it is fucking awful. So the story of AC3 is probably my biggest issue with the whole thing because it's got layers to how bad it is. Let's start out with the first problem, and that's the first third of the game. No, I'm not even kidding. It's a 10 hour game. This is about three hours of it. You'll start the game as Haytham Kenway, who is a complicated issue, but let's start with what his part is before we get to the problems I have with it. You'll start with him attending a play where he makes his way across the theater in order to kill his target, which I have to say is pretty visually spectacular. Just something about the colors of the theater and the extravagance paired with his elegance really sets the right tone for the character and the game. There's no big fuss or fight when he reaches his target, just a man who knows he's been beaten and another man doing what he must. Although I will say this moment where Haytham tells the boy to be quiet is straight out of a horror movie. The calm, measured nature he takes with the approach, the kill, and the escape make this an instant win for me when it comes to Haytham as a character. The return with this prize and be ordered to head to America in search of the precursor door the key he's just acquired from his target is supposed to open. He's given the names of five people sympathetic to the cause who he is to find while he's there in order to help him. Your journey will start on a ship and you can get into it with the crew a little bit and find yourselves at odds with the captain, but he needs your help. With talk of mutiny around the ship, he'll recruit you to find the traitors and unravel the plot. The twist comes in when it turns out while there has been talk of mutiny, that's not where the trouble brews from, as it turns out it's actually an assassin after Haytham that causes the conflict. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that Haytham is a Templar. They try to hide this by having him go about things in an assassin-ish way, along with wearing a hidden blade adorned with the assassin symbol, but there's no reason to hide it from you here in this context. The interesting note is that when confronted by the assassin, he's given the chance to surrender and avoid the bloodshed, 
but Haytham requests a sword instead, to which Mills agrees, and you have a pretty fun little duel, until it occurs to you to disarm him and batter the dude into a corner, but anyway. Some other stuff will happen, but all that matters is that you end up in Boston. You'll meet your first co-conspirator in Charles Lee and work on collecting the others while working to find the precursor door that you came here for. One of the missions you'll take part in is freeing native slaves from the British, and the woman who appears to be the leader will catch Haytham's eye. You'll track her down during the winter and convince her that you're on the same side, and she'll agree to work with you. You agree to take on the British commander that has been hounding you and leads the force to drive out the natives from their lands, first breaking into a fort to find out where his battle plans are, then organizing an ambush. After killing the leader, she will take you to the door you hope to find, only to learn it can't be opened with the key you have, but in other news, they smash and this will lead to Connor. Then you get the big twist that they've actually been following a Templar this whole time. Here's my problem with Haytham. He's too damn good of a character. You can't stick him with me for hours, then rip him out of my hands, declare that he's evil, and make me play whiny little bitch Connor. Haytham embodies a ton of what I want to see in my characters. He's intelligent, level-headed, with a controlled fire within him. Imperfect but aware of it, charismatic and loyal. Through him, you can see that the Templars aren't such bad people as has been shown through the other games plenty of times. He even works as a villain because for all his positive traits, it's still plain to see that Connor's ideals, whether from the assassins or his own personal viewpoint, will never align with Haytham's. I'm pissed off because I don't even have a good reason to be upset. It's like they wasted my time by having me play as Haytham, but it's also the best part of the game, so I don't even know where to stand on the topic. I don't know. Maybe I'll come back, but let's move it along for now. At least I can play as the main character of the game I bought. Oh, for fuck's sake! I have to spend an hour and a half as Child Connor now? Hold on, let me skim through this and figure out what the bare minimum I can talk about is so I don't bore you to death. Alright, so the big kicking off point is that you'll start off playing hide and seek with friends, blah blah blah, but then you'll be captured by Charles Lee, Haytham's second in command who we met earlier. This is very solid, actually, as Connor will show his ironclad resolve even at a young age, spitting in Charles's face, telling him nothing about where his village is, then asking his name, promising to find him later on. None of this matters, however, as Charles Lee will proceed to knock you out, find the village, and then burn it down, but it's a great character moment as well, as making his way back to his village after he wakes up, ignoring the fires, he will try to find his mom. After demonstrating his strength rather than his intelligence, a very common trait throughout this game, by lifting a burning log he could have just walked under with no issues, he'll find his mother trapped and, unable to free her, have to suffer her loss. Connor will say later in the game that this attack was under Haytham's order, but if Connor finds that out here, it isn't shown. An older Connor will move on with the tribe and eventually set out with the only a general area in the Assassin's Crest to guide him. After having a stubborn off and fighting some dudes off in the night, Achilles will finally agree to train Connor, although begrudgingly. I should mention that his name isn't actually Connor, it's which I'm never going to try to pronounce, although it's very cool sounding. Achilles gave him the name Connor in order to try and help him integrate with a racist society a little bit better, something a black man in the colonies would certainly be aware of. They will travel to Boston, and when we see your dad, who I'm not quite sure how Connor recognizes, I mean, I guess he saw him for like five seconds from a bad angle in his spirit journey, dream, whatever, but alright. Achilles will have you tell the guy he's talking to because it looks like he's planning to turn his outrage into a riot. Turns out he's right, and we stop the shooter before he can pop things off. Dad is thorough, though, and Charles Lee on a different rooftop will fire the shot that starts the Boston Massacre. I do enjoy the way Assassin's Creed fits their stories into real-life events in a believable way. Haytham then sees us and orders the guards to hunt us down. Thankfully, a very helpful Achilles, um, leaves? Okay. But we find ourselves in the care of Samuel Adams, who will tell us to go tear down one of the posters of ourselves and just kind of hopes for the best. He'll then introduce you to the series of underground tunnels that connect the city, which I never used again outside of missions requiring them. When you get home, Achilles will pretend it's all cool in the hood after leaving you to die, saying you needed experience. You'll then be introduced to the concept of homestead missions, where you can invite new people to your little plot of land and help them grow, which adds to your overall standard of living. I was actually really excited about this because before I started my replay, I happened to be watching a video that discussed AC3's homestead missions and how they were often missed by players but had some of the best moments in the game, showing a more interesting side of Connor along with a lot of his better character development. So that was a fucking lie. Yeah, fuck that. Don't let anyone lie to you. These missions are generic and boring. I did so many of these in good faith just wondering when they got good because in fairness, it's not uncommon for games like this to have side content that's some of the best in the game but takes some time to open up. This is in fact not the case here, and apart from maybe Connor killing some poachers, which is good, these missions might actually detract from Connor as a character. I mean, look at this cringe. Prudence. Good day, Connor. Norris is trying to court a woman. 
What do you women like in terms of gifts? I can't emphasize enough how much of a waste of time these missions will be if you bother with them. Anyways, moving on, we'll get introduced to yet another gameplay addition that you'll basically never need to use again in sailing. Wait, sailing, parkour, homestead missions, assassin recruits. Yeah, those exist here, but are so pointless. I didn't bring them up. How many mechanics does this game have that you have no reason to use? Jesus, I found the problem. They had an Assassin's Creed game and made everything that set the game apart optional. Hunting too, now that I think about it. Man, what a Ubisoft move. Anyway, the ship combat here is fun. It's not as refined as Black Flag, but that's perfectly fine as it's the main mechanic there and one I almost never used here. Don't get me wrong, there's plenty of optional sailing content, but I try to be genuine when I do these playthroughs, dipping into everything but not wasting time with things I would never actually play if I weren't doing a review, and this is just one of those things I wouldn't take time out of my day to do. I often credit these videos with exposing me to great parts of the games I would have never bothered with on my own, but honestly, AC3 side content is simply disappointment after disappointment, but I digress. No, I don't digress. I rant, and I'm sorry. Back to the story. For that, I'm also sorry. So about four hours into a 10 hour game, you'll be given your assassin's hood and finally get the chance to actually play the game. What a treat! It's at this point you're pulled out of the Animus to do a mission as Desmond when you're sent to recover a power source that will help unlock the door you've been working towards opening. Y'all ready for another angry sidetrack? It's been like three sentences since the last one, so I know you're ready for it. I want to comment on risking Desmond's life to do this. Like, I get it, he's the only one who actually does stuff, but like, if he dies, this has all been for nothing. He's the only one with the memories and the only one who can open the door. I'd like to comment on all that, but I'm stuck on what the fuck happened to Desmond's face. Everyone's face is really, I mean, my god. I can understand this just what happens when you move to a new generation of facial technology, but I mean, holy shit, they look like clay faces, and it's really off-putting. This is literally the last game Desmond will be in, and no one will care about new faces for Sean and Rebecca and their cameos in future games, so I mean, just damn, write it out for one more game, man, don't do this to me. Anyways, the mission is actually pretty fun as they have the one hope for humanity yeet himself off a building and hope his parachute opens before confronting a gunman while unarmed, which could have gone very bad. You'll get back to playing Connor and the game kicks off when our friend from the tribe comes to tell us of a plot to steal the tribe's land from them so Connor will bury a hatchet to the pillar of the house to which Achilles promptly what the fucks because regardless of tradition, this is not your house, bro. <laughs> Anyways, this is Connor's way of signifying he's going to war with any who would harm the tribe. You'll go see Sam Adams about finding this William Johnson who's the one looking to buy land out from under the tribe. So here's something I actually really like about Assassin's Creed and making these videos. I learn things. Let's let this conversation play out and then talk about it. Uh, it's good to see the people finally taking a stand against injustice. Says the man who owns a slave. <laughs> Ooh, sorry. I practice what I preach, my friend. She's not a slave, but a freed woman, at least on paper. Men's minds are not so easily turned. It's a tragedy that for all our progress, still we cling to such barbarism. Then speak out against it. We must focus first on defending our rights. When this is done, we'll have the luxury of addressing these other matters. You speak as though your condition is equal to that of the slaves. It is not. Tell that to my neighbor who is compelled to quarter British troops, or to my friend whose store was closed because he displeased the crown. The people here are no freer than Surrey. You offer excuses instead of solutions. All people should be equal, and not in turns. It's in turns, or not at all. We must compromise, Connor. Alright, so I think Ubisoft's willingness to show the uglier side of American history is commendable, especially being a French developer who could have taken a lot of flack for it. I also appreciate how they have a genuine argument from the other side. Connor has the easiest side of the argument here, as it's simple to say slavery bad, no more, but it's more complicated from Adam's point of view. From his point of view, he's being oppressed to the same degree. Now from the outside looking in, we know that being unfairly taxed and treated like a second class citizen isn't in the same realm as slavery, but perspective is important when discussing these things. And to Sam Adam's credit, he has a leg to stand on by saying he can't change anything when he can't even vote on his own taxes. In turns or not at all is a great example of what Achilles said earlier. What's true and what is aren't always the same. I do appreciate the game made me look up and learn more about Sam Adams, learning he was in fact outspoken against slavery, but wasn't in fact in favor of outright abolishing slavery, stating that it would have to have been done gradually, which is interesting and I feel as though his character is well represented in the game. 
This is the core character flaw we find in Connor, that he sees the world in black and white, always willing to speak out against something he views as wrong, but never willing to step back and look at the bigger picture of how we accomplish this goal, not only today, but keep it solved in the future. While it's a reality that we may not want to acknowledge, Sam Adams' view of taking things one step at a time and trying to change core issues in the system is probably better in the long term, something Connor refuses to even consider while not offering up any alternatives. So anyway, you save an angry French dude and then blow up some of Johnson's smuggled cargo he's using to fund his land grab. Go then follow said angry French dude as he partakes in one of the most globally enjoyed pastimes in telling the British to go fuck themselves. After that, you'll join in on the Boston Tea Party, which even with damn near constant conflict, they managed to make boring. Don't really know how they managed that. Connor thinks that it's over because he destroyed the tea that Johnson was using as resources he needed to buy the land, so he retreated. Achilles disagrees, saying that you should have killed him and that he'll just come back, but Connor's a smart young lad and knows better than that old fart. So anyway, he comes back almost immediately and Connor will go and kill him. At least he doesn't make the same mistake twice. We also make a return to the Templar who you've just killed making a little too much sense, then proceeding to tell you that your actions will doom them, he's also right about how events will play out in the end. Next up, we take part in Paul Revere's ride, which manages to take all the magic out of something I thought of as being super cool. Hopefully it was in real life. We then take part in the Battle of Lexington and Concord by riding back and forth and pressing B on different groups of troops in something that is, again, somehow less cool in a fictional game than it is in the real life event. It's like they had a list of notable revolutionary events they had to hit, but had no idea how to make Connor relevant in any of them without tearing down what made them significant. Okay, so moving on to another moment that irks me more than it probably should. Connor will be here listening to a speech when he notices Charles Lee behind him. Okay, first of all, he's one row behind you in a two-row room. How did you just notice him? Are you stupid? Well, we know the answer to that, but whatever. Also, I was led to believe that killing this man was Connor's singular goal in life, and he's just gonna let him walk out the door? No catch me outside, how about that? No tailing him after the meeting, nothing? I just, I just don't believe the character who spends the whole game talking about being about that action and not letting injustice slide would give the dude who burned his village down and killed his mom a free pass. But there's a war on, so whatever, we head off to the Battle of Bunker Hill, and after a jaunt through the town, take out two of the ships bombing the town so that we can take the town and search for our newest target in John Pitcairn. Following this, we get the big set piece of the game as we run across a battlefield from cover to cover in order to get behind enemy lines and assassinate said Pitcairn, whose security detail immediately stops caring the moment you kill him. Like, <laughs> what is this? The man claims that he only wanted to open Discord for talks of peace, but we've ruined any chance for that. Connor's last words to this man are that it is better to believe in something than nothing at all. Which makes absolutely no sense in the context of two people who were just arguing about what they believe. I, I feel like they just really wanted him to say that, but didn't think it through and hope no one would think about it. It's like the end of fucking Black Panther. Next up, we get Connor throwing a temper tantrum after getting cooked by Achilles. The argument is broken up when we find out we have company as Connor's whisked away to New York in search of Thomas Hickey, who will begin our search for by tailing some counterfeiters. This goes poorly when you're caught with Hickey in a bag full of fake money. Believe it or not, the that's not mine approach did not keep him from getting arrested. I should mention the whole reason you were after him was to spoil a plot to kill George Washington, something that'll be pretty difficult from inside prison, so you'll escape, or at least give it your best try. The Templars are a step ahead and will use your ill-fated escape attempt in order to use your execution as bait to draw and kill Washington. Thankfully, Achilles and the assassins have your back and we get what I think was supposed to be a blood-pumping life-or-death moment where we stop Hickey right before he takes down Washington, but in my game he bumped into an NPC and I had him in like seconds. Although he might actually be my favorite character in the game. Check out his last words. The Templars, Lee, the big man, Hypham, they has the money, they has the power. That's the reason I threw him with them. That's the only reason. Sure, they have some sort of vision for the future, too. I didn't give a damn about any of that. They can sing their songs about mankind and its troubles. They can make their plans and spring their traps. Don't bother me none. They paid me, so I said yes. Didn't bother to ask who or how or why. Didn't care. You chose to side with men who would rob us of our humanity simply because it was more profitable? What else is there? I'm not some blind fool who give up all I've got on principle. What is principle anyway? Can you bring it to the bank? Don't look at me like that. We're different, you and I. You're just some blind fool who's always chasing butterflies. Whereas I'm the type of guy 
who likes to have a beer in one hand and a tea in the other. Thing is, boy, I can have what I seek, had it even. You, your hands will always be empty. Not all villains have some grand worldview. Some are just men who care not for your views on morality, simply throwing in with who will pay them. It doesn't make for spectacular storylines, but it does make for a more grounded one. And as with many of the final words Connor will hear over the game, they will ring a little too true as he tells Connor his hands will always be empty. We'll pop into the signing of the Declaration of Independence before I'm being dragged out again to find another power source as Desmond. And again, it's pretty damn crazy to send him, but it's a pretty fun mission as you work through a sports venue on your way to steal another power source that's, and I quote, being worn as a bracelet by some tycoon's wife. In what fucking world does this remotely resemble something that can be considered a bracelet? I mean, I, I just, what? I can't with these people, bro. Send me back to Connor. He has an argument with Achilles, and while he has the elegance of a buttered up rhino falling down the stairs, he makes some valid points about how, while he may be doing too much, Achilles has been doing too little. We ride for Valley Forge to warn Washington of the plot on his life, where he tells us about how they're missing wagonfuls of supplies and he suspects a traitor named Benjamin Church, also a Templar, is behind it so Connor tells him he'll help. When asked why he would volunteer his help, Connor responds by asking why it matters, and I like that George doesn't push the issue. It aligns very well with the man he was at the time, just pushing ahead for the cause, taking any win he can get. We go to ambush Church at the church. Oh, come on, guys! And we're ambushed by our dad who immediately decided to kill Connor like the smarter than our main character kind of guy he is. Thankfully for Connor, Haytham reconsidered and presents that since he's also after Church, they have a reason to work together and maybe he can sway you into joining his side. You'll track Church's movements through the forest and sneak into his camp to eavesdrop on his men before dad gets caught and you need to go rescue him. He'll just up and leave in the middle of the fight that you started to rescue him, telling you to meet him in New York and man, he's doing a really great job at winning us over. You do meet Dad in New York, and they have a conversation in which Connor asks what it is the Templars want. In his own words, order, purpose, and direction, stating that it was the assassins who were misguided in their aimless goal of freedom, and that they used to at least dream of peace. It's interesting because both father and son show their ignorance here. Connor will say how freedom is peace, which everyone who isn't 16 knows isn't true, but Haytham makes a mistake here too. The Templars also used to dream of peace, a goal he doesn't list among the others they search for today. Both of them seem ignorant of the history of their orders, which when they started were both after the same goal of peace, they only differed on how to get there, one through order, one through freedom. It's a very well done metaphor for political ideology, but I'm not sure if I'm willing to give the writers here credit for that, as based on everything else around it, they might have just accidentally stumbled into something intelligent. Now that I've noticed how much the core values have been lost from both sides, at this point I'll be interested to see how each side defines themselves in future games as we explore different timelines. You'll steal an enemy uniform and use Haytham's connections to church in order to get into the building. Then we get a randomly good scene between the two, which is better to just watch. Must be strange for you, discovering my existence as you have. I'm actually curious to know what your mother might have said about me. Always wondered what life might have been like had she and I stayed together. How was she, by the way? Dead. Murdered. What? I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, you're sorry. I found my mother burning alive. I'll never forget her face as she sent me away. Charles Lee is responsible for her death by your order. And you're sorry. It's impossible. I gave no such order. I spoke the opposite, in fact. I told them to give up the search for the precursor site. We were to focus on more practical pursuit. It is done. And I'm all out of forgiveness. I really don't think Haytham knew what happened here, and I'm positive he didn't order it. He might be the antagonist here, but I don't think he's straight up a villain, which is nice. Anyways, it's a fake church that leads to an ambush, but we're able to learn that he sailed away, so we take the Aquila to pursue him. Dad bitches and moans as we tail a smaller ship through small passageways, but then we learn naturally it's another trap, and it's a man of war he's actually on. Disable Church's ship, destroy the escorts, and climb aboard to get after our man. We catch up to Dad beating the piss out of the dude. Connor will step in so he can learn the location of the supplies before he dies. Church spouts some shit about how the British aren't the bad guys, and my knee-jerk reaction is to call him stupid, but then he hits on the argument I just made a few pages back. Connor's refusal to at any point consider a point of view other than his own is what makes him such a painful protagonist. 
He never seems to learn or grow over the course of the game. See himself as correct regardless of the evidence he finds to the contrary. To be honest, off the top of my head, I can't think of a worse person in the game. Maybe Charles Lee, I guess. There are many flawed people in the game, but for all Connor's strength, he does walk his path with his eyes closed, or at least with blinders on. On top of that, he looks dumb as fuck in his My Little Sailor outfit. Wait, wait, wait. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. Is he? Oh my god. Guys, guys, guys. I think he's using his brain. This is wild. Actually considering the points dad made and thinking critically? I never thought I'd see the day. Let's see if he contradicts himself almost immediately or afterwards decides that, in fact, no, he's right. Coming home to Achilles with an apology is a good start, but then he's talking about teaming up with the Templars, which is bold as hell, but we can see how it plays out. Haytham, who actually does adjust his plans as things change, now intends to take the fight to the Loyalists and help get rid of the crown, so we'll go after some officers in an attempt to gain info on their plans. We interrogate them, then kill them, to which Connor says, we shouldn't have killed them, you didn't have to do that, like he didn't do it one at a time, a foot away from him while he watched. First one's a surprise, my man, but the third one's gotta be on you, right? Connor chooses to report this info to Washington, who Haytham continues to try to convince you isn't the good guy. We then happen to find out that he sent men to kill your tribe, burn your village down, and salt their fields. Super not cool, George. Connor actually does the right thing here, telling them both to go fuck themselves. When Dad tries to play hero, Connor is hearing none of it, saying that he was probably sitting on this information the whole time to use in a moment like this. Which, logically, he's probably right about. He'll then chase down and kill Washington's riders, proving his loyalty to his people above all else, which is nice. He shows up to find out that Charles Lee is already there leading the tribe to battle against the Patriots, although we never see him, clearly intending to start a war. You take down all the other guys non-lethally, but will be forced to kill your friend who, for some reason, believes Charles Lee over you. He was never very bright, to be fair. Lee rides out to betray the Patriots to the Loyalists, so Connor will ride to help the Patriots by manning a cannon and covering the retreat. Washington is finally convinced that Lee might be a traitor and promises to look into it. Connor tells him plainly that if he doesn't kill Lee, we will. So we're back on our I'm gonna kill Charles Lee above anything else thing, I guess. Feels like that keeps getting pushed to the side. So anyways, we'll push it to the side as we get pulled out of the Animus. Desmond's dad went to get the third power source they located, but naturally gets captured, so we'll head to Abstergo headquarters to get him out. Desmond gets, um, extremely violent during this section. Like seriously, I know these guards are working for the evil machine or whatever, but just look at the way he cuts into them. It's downright brutal. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's super impressive, but just... damn. Then after stabbing four people to death, he just casually hops in the elevator. God, he's ugly in this game. Ugh. He proceeds to kill his way through the building until he runs into Wesley's dad from Wanted, who makes a point I've been screaming about this whole time. Let's not draw this out. You got nowhere to go, and I've got a gun. Speaking of which... It's the 21st century, and you're still running around with only a tiny knife for protection? <laughs> it's stupid. All right, Desmond. Game's over. Then, because they wanted to have this aha, I've got a gun moment, but wrote themselves into a corner, he falls victim to Deus Ex Machina spirit magic, forcing him to run away from us, and we, for some reason, chase him through the facility. We then get his gun, but for some reason it can only hold one bullet at a time, which looks really stupid with the extended magazine you took the time to model. You then scare the secretary, who's still there for some reason, who lets us in, where we find Dad being held hostage in a room full of gunmen. Desmond then goes on a pretty dark power trip where he has some of the gunmen take out Vidic before forcing them all to sell forever sleep, which I'm pretty sure I can't show on YouTube. You can actually make like dozens of guards do this on the way out, but I'm not quite the monster that Claymation Desmond is, so I just chose to walk out instead. You'll get back in the Animus and it seems like Achilles dies, but I see him pop up later in a homestead mission and Connor kind of seems to gloss over it here, so I'm not really clear if he's dead or dying in this moment, I don't know. Connor will focus his efforts on getting into Fort George so he can kill Charles Lee. This will involve a battle for the Chesapeake Bay where you'll pilot the Aquila against the British Navy's onslaught, which is pretty damn great. Then, using the coastal dominance you've acquired to shell, um, yourself? Great plan, Connor. Seriously, 10 out of 10, IGN. He will literally say the words, I'm in no condition to fight, as he tumbles towards Lee's position only to find Dad there instead, who's pulling no punches. You then have a very exciting, we're both super hurt fight, where you defeat him by pushing him into several barrels and a table that the camera rejects. You then pull out the most anticlimactic kill I've ever seen by simply stabbing him with no fanfare. Atham goes out like he lived, sure of his ideals and with no apologies. 
Connor then cuts his hair and shows up to Dad's funeral so he can kill Lee. His plan, as it turns out, is just to walk up to him and get captured without a fight so he can add another 45 minutes to this game for some annoying ass reason. You'll also play this section with your hood down so everyone can see your new haircut. It's just, it's not really as cool as they think it is. Use some stuff that doesn't matter to track him down and during the final chase, I'm 100% sure that if it wasn't for scripting, I would have caught him like halfway through right here. Again, we succumb to even more padding as this isn't even the end as you have to get on a boat, walk your ass across the frontier just to meet him at a bar, stab him unceremoniously, and leave. There seems to be this moment of mutual respect between the two that I can understand coming from Charles, but not Connor. I can't imagine any world in which Connor would share a last drink with this dude who burned his mother alive! Anyways, there's no death scene where he gets to say his piece and Connor shows him kindness, so I guess that's neat, at least. He heads back to the village to find it abandoned with only the piece of Eden left behind for him to find, which has orders in it from Juno in which he needs to hide the key where no one will ever find it, essentially telling him what everyone else in the game did. That he strives for that which doesn't exist and he'll never find what he's looking for. He'll then dig up Achilles' dead son who it turns out was named Connor. There's actually a good amount of emotional weight on that one, finding out just how much he meant to Achilles, who clearly saw him as a son. So anyway, we'll dig up Achilles' other son's grave, to hide the key, but when the camera shifts, you can see that they did not, in fact, dig a hole. I don't know why I have to say this, but if you're not going to bother to model the hole, just don't let me move the camera to see that it isn't there. Jesus, it's fucking amateur hour around here. So we return to present day, go get the key, open the door, and watch as five games of Desmond's story collapses in on itself in one of the worst endings I've ever seen in a video game. Maybe media in general. I don't even know where to begin with how maddeningly stupid this is. Okay, let's start by rolling this back a little to the core concepts of the series. I'm willing to acknowledge that Desmond spent most of his life wanting nothing to do with the assassins, but this has clearly changed as of his time in the loading program in Revelations and over the course of this game. He's fully embraced his life as an assassin and falls in with their ideals at this point. So what ideals do I speak of? The entire concept of the assassins was to fight for a world in which every man, woman, and child was free. For better or for worse, they believed a free people given the tools to make a great society is how the world should be. No overarching power making decisions for people, favoring the chaos of freedom over being controlled. Their core idea is to allow humanity to make its own decisions and end up where it will. That's been their whole thing, right? Okay, so let's talk about what's happening here. Minerva will show up and tell us we've been duped. While the other precursors fought to save the world, Juno sought to control it, so she was locked away. But now she managed to trick us in almost releasing her, which is where we are now. While our ancestors along with us thought that we were fighting to find a solution left behind for us, we didn't understand. The assassins and Templars have spent centuries in conflict looking for the answer, not understanding that what in fact was left behind was the tools to find the answer instead. But now it's too late and there's no way to stop the coming end. Juno tells Minerva to show us what will happen. It turns out that if the solar flare does in fact hit Earth, then it won't be the end of the world, just the end of the world as we know it. In her words, the ground will crack and spit fire and all of humanity will burn. But Desmond will emerge and gather what's left of humanity, becoming a symbol to those who survive of hope, helping to rebuild and stop this from ever happening again. The world will heal and in time, you will die. And over time, the religion will form around your image and the words you pass on in an effort to preserve life will be used to justify taking it. I'm mad at the game right now, so I'm not even going to argue for either side about how religious symbols affect the world for better or for worse. They don't deserve that argument. The alternative Juno provides is that if you free her, she will prevent this tragedy. Minerva warns that she will make slaves out of humanity, which Juno doesn't even pretend to argue she won't do. Then Minerva pleads with Desmond talking about exactly what I did earlier, that you've spent this whole fight working to ensure that mankind would be free and that freeing Juno would go against everything we stand for. Desmond isn't having it though, choosing to lay down and die, allowing the world to become slaves to Juno, which I can't even begin to discuss how stupid it is. He says that no matter what happens, we will find a way to stop her, but um, no, we won't. Everyone you leave behind will have to deal with that. This is played off as the morally right decision because saving everyone is the right thing to do, but I wholeheartedly disagree. You see in the future, you know humanity will survive and that we will rebuild. But rather than that, you've chosen to just beg at the feet of a would-be deity and just endure? I've played a better game that had this exact line of logic, and funny enough, he was the villain in that game. Is submission not preferable to extinction? 
This isn't even the right choice by any means, and I have no idea why they chose to make a villain out of their protagonist at the end of the game. You don't even get a choice here, you just have to sit and watch Desmond damn the world and be treated as a hero for doing it. At the very least, true to her word, Juno will in fact use this power to save the world, so that's nice, I guess. Oh, and then we get the epilogue, and where Connor finds that the world he fought to help free will move on with different masters, allowing for slavery and betraying the promises they made of a better future. Well, isn't that a little bit on the nose? Yeah, maybe this is saying that, like in America, the world under Juno could get better over time. I'm proud of the progress we made as a nation, but we made that progress because regardless of the mistakes we made in the beginning, the core value of this country was the ability to change and do better. Something that is not found in the core beliefs of Juno! So there you go, you spent five games and dozens of hours to watch your main character doom mankind. Now, of course, none of this will be brought up in future games because we don't have the balls for that. But that's not what we're talking about here, I suppose. I really wanted to call this a nothing burger of a game, and in a lot of ways it is, but in reality it's worse than that. We got an upgraded combat system just for any combat outside of missions to be punished by making sure you can't walk around town. The same with the all new spontaneous side content you're discouraged from participating in. They give us awesome new free running animations and refine the system even further, making it in a lot of ways feel better than before, but you'd never know because they put it in a setting where the best way between two points is just to do a boring run where you're going to be at ground level. There's no reason to climb anything. You gave me exciting new naval combat, no reason to use it, gaining me nothing outside the experience of doing it, which isn't enough for side content. You make me play a third of the game as someone who not only isn't the main character, but someone who would have made an infinitely better main character. If Haytham had been the one going after Charles Lee, this game would have been like an hour long, I swear. Then again, if Connor actually went after Charles Lee, the game also would have been an hour long, so who the fuck cares? Oh, we've got a homestead to take care of now. Look forward to asking what girls like and playing Bowls, the national game of English retirement homes everywhere. We get an annoying little asshole of a protagonist who refuses to ever learn, grow, or consider the bigger picture, only to find out in the end after freeing a country that would allow slavery, destroy his tribes and hundreds like it, killing his best friend and his own father, that everything he did was essentially for nothing, just a pawn to be moved around the board by Juno, a mystery he couldn't even comprehend, let alone solve. This game is a nothing burger of food poisoning. It doesn't deserve to be spoken of in the same world as the games that came before it. For all their faults, they were better than this. Assassin's Creed 3 is one of the single most infuriating games I've ever played and definitely the most infuriating I've ever talked about. It shouldn't have been made a decade ago, it shouldn't be played today, nor spoken of tomorrow. This is not a game to be tossed aside lightly, it should be thrown with great force. Yeah, I stole that quote and I couldn't care less. This game stole 12 hours of my fucking life. Double that if you count my first playthrough a decade ago. God, I fucking hate this game. No outro. Black Flag next. Goodbye. Fucking hell. I fucking hate this shit. Fuck this stupid ass goddamn fucking game. I'm fucking pissed off. I'm a fucking pot right here. Fucking help. Need a banana.